introduce the topic we are talking about. It is extremely sensitive one, radicalization. And uh, of course, I'm just uh, putting some open questions for the panelists and starting from the former Prime Minister or Jordan uh, Prime Minister Mastri, I will uh, give all the panelists some five to six minutes in order to have time to uh, a reaction after uh, a question from the audience. Um, uh, some uh, brief points. When we talk about radicalization, in uh, my view, we are talking about a global phenomenon that uh, affects in various degrees some uh, 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 key elements of human civilization. We go from those that uh, incite or make propaganda to those who, uh, again in my view, commit the most blasphemic crime which is killing in the name of God. These are various degrees of humiliation of key principles of our civilization. So uh, I would make first a distinction. I wouldn't uh, have a never a justification for extremism leading to violent action. Rather, we have to address root causes. And these will be uh, the points that hopefully the panelists will discuss. What are the root causes that, uh, of course, lead to uh, radicalization? Uh, there is a combination of factors that the panelists will explore. The key role of lack of education, or even worse, education to violence. This is unfortunately a serious problem. The uh, lack of hopes for a better future. You know perfectly what happens in case of disillusions come uh, among the younger generations, particularly after some non-satisfactory results of the so-called Arab Springs, and the feeling of exclusion. And the feeling of exclusion can be found not only in countries in Northern Africa or in broader Middle East, but in Europe. In our Europe, feeling of exclusion is one of the root causes, maybe leading well-educated people to radicalize. What is the role of recruiters? This would be a quite interesting point. How they try to exploit fragile people to become uh, radicalized or uh, uh, to get them in the organization, and then the difficult point, how to prevent, how to react, how to prevent radicalization from spreading further, how to act with those that are still hesitant, are still uncertain before they become radical, and how to react in some particular cases, not only in general, I have a specific point. In many cases, uh, radicalization is combined with the use of modern technologies. How to prevent and how to react uh, against the use, the misuse of uh, extremely important uh, uh, new media and new technologies that are used for criminal uh, purposes and propaganda. And what kind of actions to restore hopes because you see, one of the root, hope, the, the, the root causes are lack of hopes, despair, how to restore hopes. And finally, a specific point, what is the role of religious leaders in addressing radicalization and helping moderate people to, uh, I would say, get a better environment in the society? These are just some open points for the discussion that I open by giving the floor to Prime Minister uh, Jordan, Mr. Taher Mashri, you know uh, much better than me and than others how is the situation in the Middle East. So with all this introduction, the floor is yours, Prime Minister. Uh, 
I almost, you almost uh, answered my, uh, my, <laughs> so I, w I was about to say, I pass to the next speaker, <laughs> because you said all the points I wanted to say. Not seriously, uh, I think uh, human beings are not born as uh, terrorists or radicals. They are made to be radicals. And we have to look for the uh, situation, for the reasons, uh, factors that have made them uh, in such a way. Whether they are uh, in this region, the Middle East or Europe or anywhere. But I think uh, I will concentrate on the uh, Middle East uh, and the uh, Arab countries uh, situation. Uh, we have, uh, we have a, a real problem in the region with the radicalization. And uh, I think uh, there are two reasons for that. Uh, to, to, be, uh, uh, to summarize or to be brief on that, the good governance. We lack good governance. And uh, w under that uh, topic, there are many other subtopics like education, like exclusion, and so on. But good governance, I think, is, is a, a major uh, key for uh, the absence of uh, uh, democratization, uh, uh, reform, and so on. Uh, the, we have to work on that. The, our, the Arab Spring that has uh, took place uh, in uh, 2011 has been the expression of the younger generation, the, the youth for uh, uh, a better life. They, they wanted to change their lives. They wanted to be part of make decision making. They want reform. Uh, unfortunately, it went astray and it did not go to its uh, direct uh, uh, position or direct aim. Uh, but uh, uh, we are hopeful that this uh, uh, religious extremism will, will start a new wave of uh, reform, uh, uh, religious reform, political reform. Uh, although it doesn't look, it, 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 it will happen quickly, but it will, uh, I think, uh, it, it, it is coming. But uh, we have to pay a, a high uh, uh, price for that. Uh, the, the radicalization is at its peak now, and uh, Jordan uh, is in the heart of the region, and uh, we are uh, really uh, uh, resisting uh, from outside and inside any, uh, any uh, play with the concept of uh, security and stability, and uh, uh, we are learning our lesson to some extent, not totally, we still have to do more. But uh, the economic situation, the economic development is a major key. We, we have to uh, insist on that, especially in our region uh, and in Jordan in particular. So uh, uh, development, economic development, uh, democratization, uh, 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 good governance, uh, good education, all of these factors are important to absorb as much as it. This is one side of it. The other side is the Palestinian question. Mm -hmm. uh, no doubt that uh, we have a problem there and uh, the, the origin of the radicalization uh, or part of the origin of the radicalization started with the Palestinian question. And uh, I, I, I'm convinced that if we solve this problem in a just manner, then we can, we would have solved half of the radicalization process that is taking place in the region. So uh, the, the Palestinian question is uh, stagnant, nothing is happening. The contrary, uh, the, uh, the settlements are being built, the uh, Jerusalem is being uh, 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 the changing the, the identity of Jerusalem. And uh, 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 yani the, nothing is happening on that uh, with the with the, all these issues uh, in the region and the Palestinian issue, which is which concerns us directly in Jordan because 
we are uh, integrated in, in many ways with the Palestinians and Palestinian issue. Uh, I think uh, uh, it will be uh, a major, a major uh, uh, solution or a major result for the situation uh, if it comes and uh, if the uh, international community deals with that. The, the, uh, the Czech ex-former president in the, in the session before, he mentioned he was saying that Europe is irrelevant, it's becoming irrelevant. Uh, I, I, I hope not, because Europe is a major uh, sound uh, uh, understanding the situation in the region and about the Palestinian uh, issue. And it has a play to play, a, a role to play. And uh, if they are shy or, or uh, for other reasons, uh, they don't want to make the U.S. Uh, as a competitor uh, for the U.S. Uh, efforts. Again, this is uh, not uh, not uh, helpful for the. Uh, I think it has a role. We are in the interdependent regions, and you can. You can help a lot in, the, in this manner. And uh, you, you can see that uh, uh, the, the illegal immigration that is happening, it is reflecting on you. It, it, is, it is not because of the Palestinian issue. But it is, uh, it is a part of it. And uh, I think uh, now many of the Syrians and the Iraqis are, are uh, immigrating uh, uh, and, and uh, dying in the sea. Uh, again, uh, I, I must say that something has to be done about the system, uh, systems. Uh, the Palestinian question, you have to look at it from a different point of view and something has to be done. And our, our uh, job, our duty in the Arab countries is to to fight for uh, uh, democratization, better, de de better reform, uh, better educational system, and so on. And the, uh, uh, so many uh, of the parties are not playing their role. The, the uh, clergy are not, uh, the religious leaders are, unfortunately, are not playing their role. Uh, uh, some, some, uh, uh, Groups are not uh, are not part of our system or are not part of our culture. Those extremist uh, uh, radical uh, organizations. Uh, we wonder where where they come from. We wonder how kind of humans can they be. So it is our our role, our part to to, to fight that, to rectify that. But definitely, we need the help of the, the international. Community, because such uh, such uh, groupings or such uh, act, uh, actions uh, are not uh, innocent. Uh, only uh, religious. They, I think we, they have uh, outside connections and outside uh, financing and so on. So the, the Europe and the international community should play that role. And uh, our civil service, civil. Uh, Civil, uh, uh, civil uh, institutions and our uh, uh, parliaments and uh, political parties should help in addition to the governments that are, some of them are uh, reluctant to, to take the right uh, steps. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Prime Minister. We have to recognize once again how important has been and is today the role of Kingdom Georgian. I have to say, uh, all the extremists and terrorists know very well that, and this is why they know that Jordan is one of the most important pillars against extremists, and this is why this kind of uh, brutality and denegations of humanity that was the assassination of your pilots. Uh, thank you very much, Prime Minister. Now I turn to uh, Minister of State, Herman de Croo. Minister of State of Belgium. Minister, you come from a country where, where there is the uh, capital of Europe, Brussels. So the question 
uh, to you is, well, uh, how uh, do you see this uh, unfortunately spreading of radicalization in countries like Belgium or France or Italy where uh, we consider lender rights or people are well educated, we offer to them opportunities and they become radicals, extremists and in some cases terrorists. It has to do maybe, Mr. Minister, with a weak European identities or weak a weakness of our values or something else? Please, Minister. Well, uh, thank you very much. Sir. We are surprised in many of our countries of the phenomenon. If you remember 10 years ago, you were speaking about the radicalization. Nobody would speak about the fact that people, youngsters, start to be extremists. And we have a lot of uh, people from, from Turkey, from Morocco, Berber, from Tunisia, living in Belgium. And I remember my first post as minister was education minister 40 years ago. I still in parliament still. And we introduced the uh, possibility to teach the Islamic religion in our schools. What was the reason? To try to have the teaching in the school environment, not to have it outside the schools. And with a great number of efforts of so-called integration, and what we discovered today, for instance Belgium, we have the highest percentage of, of so-called Syrian soldiers, IS, yes, uh, volunteers, I could say, and not of the first generation, the third and the fourth generation. And we were wondering why, why that happens. Uh, a lot of reasons could be explained, I just give a few of them. Uh, we tried in Belgium to start a very early uh, preparatory education. People can go to schools from the age of two years and six months. And then they know enough uh, French or Dutch to start in the uh, so first year of the basic education. But what happens? That in some families, with, with respect for the Islam religion, children are not doing that preschool training. Which means that when they reach school at the age of six, they, they don't know neither French nor Dutch and have a handicap will, will be with them for the rest of their days. And so we have extreme results. Brussels must be one of the richest cities of Europe and has the highest percentage of youth unemployment. <coughs> Most of them are people for adoptal origin, second, third generation. There's one additional factor we discovered recently is television. Uh, a lot of people learn their language, in Italy it was the case decades ago in France too, by TV. Now most of those families have the satellite antennas, never follow the so-called Belgian European what you wish, TV programs. So you see a delayed start in education, a non-parallel training in a language they could uh, know better to integrate, and we are reserving then at the age of 18, 19, of a group of unemployed, unqualified youngsters who, who are more or less the prey of a radicalization. We try to, to, to discover that, to detect that, to make seminars, to put people on the street corners, to try to identify what happens and why it happens. And I can tell you, those who know the results, I will congratulate them, but we are still trying to find out what went wrong and how, where, and how fast it happens. And there is no, no straightforward uh, explanation. Um, what we try to discover is that it is an isolation aspect. And sometimes those people are playing a role of being, looking as integrated, but mentally being far away of the, the world in which they are living. And because the Schengen is there, the easy way to, to enter and to leave Europe, uh, the, the, the multimedia, the way of which they can communicate, and you see creating an isolated world of youngsters who at the second or third generation, we as an alibi, we believe in everything to degrade, they are not, and they have a parallel life, are captured. By, by a certain number of propagandists disappear 
And the great danger is that uh, they can come back with all the problems which we could have. We have, uh, I'm finished with that, we could, uh, we could avoid uh, a terrorist attack some months ago. We are in alert three throughout the country. It, it, it doesn't work very, very nicely. And we do not find, we have to confess that, the solution as a system to try to avoid world radicalization and the facts. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting point. I think we'll be uh, back to that point, Minister, in the second round, maybe. Now I would turn to Madame uh, Dalal Bint Alardi. Uh, she is member of Magia Shura from Saudi Arabia. Madam, I have a particular question for you. I was uh, really interested uh, talking about the role that I mentioned of religious leaders from the fact that the king of Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, King Salman, a week ago or something more, he convened a quite important meeting among all the Sunni religious leaders to put forward, to encourage them to put forward a very strong statement against any kind of extremism and even more terrorism and uh, uh, sticking to the uh, uh, real sense of the Muslim religion, which is a religion of peace. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Because uh, this would be uh, one of the uh, golden examples to be repeated uh, after Saudi Arabia. Please. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, before I start, uh, I want to uh, thank uh, uh, Nidami uh, International Center uh, to attend and uh, talk about this uh, subject. Uh, Allow me, please, uh, I use the, my native language because I feel comfortable of me and speak uh, Arabic. Uh, I, I will translate. Thank you. I want to focus on a very important issue in the Arab country. Of course, we are one of the countries that are affected by the violence. But I want to focus on this issue وبأن هناك دراسة وعدة في المملكة أثبتت أن نسبة التطرف قليلة جدا نسبة اثنين بالمئة. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for for being here, but I do want to respond first of all by saying that I come from Saudi Arabia, and Saudi Arabia tends to be accused as a country where there is extremism. Uh, but we have uh, undertaken a detailed study and we find that the number of extremists is quite small, less than 2%. The country has its the and I think that the Saudi Arabia has to للمملكة سوف أشير قبل جهود الملك سلمان حفظه الله سوف أشير إلى تجربتين تجربة في الداخل وتجربة في الخارج التجربة التي في الخارج هي مركز الملك عبد الله للحوار مع الأديان والثقافات والموجود فيه في أبنى openly and publicly the issue of extremism is one of the best ways of fighting it. And uh, I want to give two examples from inside Saudi Arabia and outside of Saudi Arabia. And uh, the one outside is the uh, inter-religious dialogue of uh, cultures that's part of the center uh, of King Abdullah in Vienna. أما التجربة التي في الداخل وهي هي مركز الأمير محمد بن نايف لمكافحة التطرف أو الإرهاب وهو للمناصحة وهذا المركز يأتي في إطار استراتيجية المملكة لمواجهة الإرهاب ويعمل على إعادة المتطرفين إلى المجتمع سواء من حيث تأهيلهم ومناقشتهم أيضا ومناصحتهم أنا شخصيا 
كعضوة في مجلس الشورى تسمنا لي زيارة هذا المركز التقيت في عدد كبير من الذين مارسوا الارهاب في دول كثيرة وتحدثوا عن تجربتهم. And uh, from uh, inside Saudi Arabia, there is the center of Prince uh, Mohammed bin Naif, which is dedicated to the rehabilitation and the re-education uh, of uh, extremist elements. Uh, these are people who have been accused and uh, captured and, uh, for being involved in extremist actions and who are serving penalties and who, in fact, have been engaged in a dialogue. And I, uh, as a member of the Shura Council, visited that center and saw them and spoke to them. أدى خدمات جديدة وحقق أيضا نجاح نجاح باهر للناس ونحن كسعوديين. بالنسبة لملك سلمان حفظه الله طبعا قبل ذلك صدر نظام في المملكة يجرب الإرهاب وأعتقد أن هذا النظام أيضا حد من نشاط بعض الفئات التخريبية داخل البلد أو حتى خارج البلاد. بالنسبة للملك سلمان من المؤكد أن الأحداث الأخيرة خاصة مسألة اليمن جعلت المملكة تفكر مرة أخرى أو جعلت الملك سلمان يفكر مرة أخرى في نفس الطريقة التي يفكر بها الملك عبد الله رحمه الله طبعا هنالك أيضا تجريب لمن أو يميز بين السنة والشيعة داخل المملكة أنا أريد أن أدلل أيضا على حادثة صغيرة حدثت قبل بضعة أيام ونتداولها كسعوديين أن هنالك شخصية اعتبارية قامت بنعت شخص ما بأنه غير سعودي بالرغم من أنه يعني من أجداده هو مقيم في لكن جذوره ليست من السعودية ماذا فعل الملك سلمان؟ قام بمنعه تماما ممارسة أي نشاط هو كان يقوم به رغبة في أن لا يشعر the, um, the center is not the only initiative. There has been, of course, uh, a legal uh, constriction against uh, terrorism. So there is a terrorism law in Saudi Arabia, which uh, has limited the range of action of uh, potential terrorists uh, in the kingdom. Uh, secondly, there uh, has been a number of actions uh, primarily uh, and most recently when we saw the events in Yemen uh, brought home the issue of Shia and Sunnah, the differences of uh, sects, the differences between people which were not present uh, or not visible in Saudi uh, society before. And so uh, King Salman has followed the, the same policies as King Abdullah uh, in this matter to insist that all Saudis are treated equally. And uh, there was a recent event where somebody, in this case, was not a matter of, of uh, religion, it was a matter of his grandfathers having come from outside of Saudi Arabia, even though his third generation uh, Saudi, was accused by a, a, a preacher of sorts that uh, uh, he was not a true Saudi and the king prevented that person who did the accusation from pursuing any of his activities because it was creating new doubts about who is a true Saudi and who isn't. نحن أيضا في السعودية نؤمن we believe that أن مكافحة التطرف هو توفير العدالة وأيضا رفاهية الشعوب والابتعاد عن التوجهات الاستعلائية واحترام الشعوب بعضها لبعض. بما ذلك دياناتها وعقائدها وعدم التعرض بسوء للرموز الدينية واحترام واحترام خصوصيات الشعوب وتنوعها في العادات والتقاليد هذا ما نؤمن به جيدا. And of course we believe that the ultimate defense against the emergence of extremism is to ensure justice, social justice, legal justice, as well as ensuring prosperity and respect for the diversities of background cultures uh, that uh, of all people. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, madam. Uh, I turn to my Italian colleague, Prime Minister Massimo D'Alema, then Foreign Minister of Italy. Uh, Massimo, you have been, uh, this is particular point, the uh, main promoter as Italian Foreign Minister of one of the most, if not the most, 
successful uh, international mission in recent years, the mission to Lebanon. You were the promoter of that, and uh, during uh, your term, you have been saying very uh, frequently what uh, Prime Minister of Jordan said that solving the Palestinian crisis would tremendously improve the environment to try to eradicate from inside radicalization. Uh, farther to what you believe that is uh, possible to say, can you also elaborate on this point, Massimo, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, let me remember before facing the issue that Franco Frattini has raised, let me remember that uh, religious fundamentalism is uh, not only prerogative of the Islamic world. Is, um, we have no time, I have no time to, to for an analysis uh, which uh, implies some consideration about the collapse of the ideologies of the, the past century and uh, about the crisis uh, we are living. Actually, when people feel uh, vulnerable economically and politically insecure, confused about the world and the society they live in, This is when uh, you see an upsurge of religious uh, fundamentalism. Let's not forget that the United States in the last 15 years has experienced a wave of religious fundamentalism, which has fueled the neocon movement, and we know the consequence. <laughs> and uh, let think of the growing weight that uh, the extremist religious parties have in Israel or settlements, movements, because I believe that uh, religious fundamentalism, plural, they used to fool each other creating the ground for a clash between civilization. But uh, there is no doubt that uh, the perception is that now, today, the radicalization of Islam is the main threat to uh, security. And uh, I believe, also because the Islamic world, at least a part of the Islamic world, because we are talking about the Arab world and maybe a part of Central Asia, not all the Islamic world, but uh, in this part of the Islamic world, the feeling of frustration, of humiliation, is particularly strong. I think, uh, 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 let me talk about uh, policies, about politics, about political approach. Um, first of all, in my opinion, we should make any effort. I'm talking about the Western world. Uh, the Prime Minister of Jordan uh, was very, very, very sincere, uh, stressing the responsibility of the Arab leadership about uh, the necessity of good governance, democratization. Well, I totally agree. Let me stress the responsibility of the Western world. First of all, I think we have to avoid falling into the trap of the religious clash between the West and the Islamic world. 
I think the most effective answer would be identifying and exposing the truth. And the truth is that the main victim of radicalization of Islam is the very Islamic world. In my opinion, the first responsibility of the West is to support the Islamic countries build their own response to extremism. And the, the international community has to be able to face and defuse the violent and destructive charge of fundamentalism by supporting, at the same time, democratization and stability. Well, it has been us talking uh, on, about a recent event. It has been us, in fact, who have contributed to a large extent to the destabilization of a vast area. And this, without having the slightest idea on how to recreate a new balance afterwards. Well, I, I want to be clear. I think by no means here that we should have defended the dictatorships in order to preserve the old balance of power. But uh, it is impossible for country like uh, European country or United States to act to destabilize an entire region without any strategic vision, without a comprehensive project for a sustainable future order, which was, in my view, a big, big mistake. And sometimes we, we have to, to, to say the truth. We have supported uh, extremists and fundamentalists. In a long term, uh, let me remember that Al Qaeda was a creation of the Americans against the Russians in, in Afghanistan. But uh, more recently, uh, Al Nusra or other movements received weapons and guns by the Western country. And uh, we cannot understand the origin of the Islamic State, ISIS, without considering the consequence of the occupation of Iraq, of incredible mistake. After the occupation, I remember having met Bremer before he decided to disband the Iraqi army. And my opinion was, friend, you are creating 300,000 unemployed with guns. And if you consider the origin of the Islamic State in Iraq, many of them come from the former regimes because the Sunni who supported the Saddam Hussein regimes felt to be excluded from the Iraqi society. Well, we cannot forget our mistakes, not because we have to blame ourselves, but because in order to avoid in the future to repeat such a mistake. How we can, shortly, support a, a, a moderate Islam country and people, which is majority of the Islamic world, who oppose the fundamentalism and terrorism. 
I, I believe that I, I want to, uh, maybe it's possible after to have uh, more discussion on that, but three ish. First of all, I believe it's extremely important to reach an agreement with Iran. Iran is indeed a key player in the region. And cooperation with Tehran will be crucial in the Iraqi context as well as in Afghanistan. And of course, it will be important for, for the future that the Iranian government should commit itself to the stabilization of the Gulf as well. And in my opinion, we have to push Iranian and Saudi Arabia because the key of the stability in the Gulf is the cohabitation, peaceful cohabitation between Saudi and Shia. And uh, I strongly believe that Saudi Arabia and Iran should engage in an open, direct, and cooperative dialogue. Second, let me stress that in order to prevent fundamentalism, it was a mistake uh, of the European Union. Uh, we, we, we made a mistake when we turned down Turkey's aspiration to reinforce its ties with the EU with the prospect of fully joining it in the future. It was a mistake, and the company got paid the consequence of that mistake. And, and last but not least, the inability of the international community to push for a fair and comprehensive solution of the Palestinian question, and indeed the fact that the prospect of the establishment of the Palestinian states has been fading away for the open hostility of the Israeli leadership and actually made impossible because of the settlements in the occupied territories. Uh, all that are feeding radical feelings in Islamic countries and certainly doesn't help the constitution of an anti-radical front. And the international community seems to be totally unable to do anything. Well, that <coughs> my view, we can help this aid. We have to help, we must help the Islamic world in fighting extremism and terrorism. But we have to do that, first of all, by political means. And second, I think we have militarily to support the Arabs, but to support, not to go there with the spirit of a crusade, because it will be the worst mistake and the big favor for the fundamentalism. Thank you very much, Massimo. <laughs> Thank you very much for all that you said. And now, uh, moving to uh, Minister Spanta, uh, we were colleagues, he was Minister of Foreign Affairs of Afghanistan. Uh, Ranjin, you know uh, how close has been uh, my country, Europe, the international community, to try to help your country fighting terrorism and stabilizing. But nevertheless, we are still concerned about the uh, irreversibility of that eradication of extremists and terrorists from Afghanistan. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. The topic we are discussing today is the pervade discourse of, of the politic and academic world today and also security factors in our world. 
allow me reduce my short statement of a few aspects of this complicated topic, in other words, with on the narrative of extremist Islamic Islamist movement in our world. Uh, because we are not talking about radicalism as a whole. Uh, we are talking about Islamist extremism. First, the current Islamist radicalism began <coughs> with the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan, as Prime Minister Dalima also briefly mentioned. The international community and the top Western countries and also the whole Islamic world, Arabian countries, they trained, equipped, and financed the radicalist element in Afghanistan to defeat during the Cold War the Soviet Union and countries. We defeated, the Afghans defeated the Soviet Union. The result was that we have now three countries as example is our host today here, the German was unified, reunified, and uh, the court was, war was over. But the loser was Afghanistan. All the, those radical elements, they stayed in Afghanistan, and the destiny of Afghanistan was in the hand of Afghans, never in this country. They began to use extremism and terrorism as tool of foreign policy for turning Afghanistan as to their backyard or a strategic gift. This is an example that we have very similar experiences not only in Afghanistan. We have in Iraq, in Syria, we have in the entire Middle East that there is some regional country plus world power. They are using Islamic extremism as tool of foreign policy. With devil standard approach. Some of them are good and other, another of them are bad. Unfortunately, this is the fact. In Afghanistan is the fact, and in Syria is, is, is the fact. This is one problem. The other problem, I, I don't have an, an, a reductionist approach to reduce a, a, to your four factors, but allow me to, to try it. The second one is to creating geographies, territories with weak or without the state. Afghanistan was an example. Iraq was the second example after the American invasion, <coughs> occupations in 2003. And this is space is a geography, a ground for growing terrorist activities using force. That's the second factors from my point of view, if you allow me my colleague from Belgium. The problems of disintegrations. I was an Afghan immigrant in Germany for 23 years. My family, myself, we was absolutely integrated in the society. But I observed as political scientist in this part of, the, of Europe, the problem of discriminations of minorities, especially minorities coming from the Islamic world. The problem of, of, of unemployment, as uh, was mentioned, among the young people from the Islamic world. And the problem also of a kind of, of, of excluding these people from socio-economic and cultural process in entire European countries. With other words, before, uh, let me to give an example from my own experiences. Before I went to Europe, I went after the Soviet invasion. I accepted the values of European democracy, enlightenment, 
and human rights. But on the ground, my own experiences was that is extremely exclusion approach in the front of the minorities coming from North Africa, Turkey, Afghanistan, Iran, and other countries. That is an, 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 another, another factor. Coming back to our part of the world, Afghanistan and, and entire Middle East, the problem of bad governance, lack of democracy, lack of participations in our countries, not only the problems of gender equality and participation of women in, 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 in our world and patriarchy in the Islamic society, but generally the lack of, 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 of democracy human rights, freedom of speech in our part of the world, which our double standard, I mean the double standard of the world democracies in this regard also is an, another reality. Some countries, because they were <coughs> pro-West oriented, that they, this country is the, the, violating human rights and uh, uh, this agreement with the freedom of, for, of, of society was not a problem, it still is not a problem. But for other countries, they are bad countries. But in other words, we had good dictators and bad dictators. And this kind of, of approach, uh, I, I mentioned four. First, using terrorism as tool of foreign policy, not only for the neighborhood of Afghanistan, also for the mm, big power of the world. Second, the bad governance in the Islamic world. Third, the problem of integrations and uh, exclusions of the minority or, or immigrant in, the, in, the, in, in, in Euro European countries. They are the main problem why we are unfold creating empty space or spaces without a state or with, with less state before having a democratic and moderate alternative, destroying the state, the national state in the, in the Middle East. These four main factors from my point of view are the causes for the rising of extremism in our part of the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now another eminent personality coming from a European member state, uh, Peter Medjeshi, Prime Minister of Hungary. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, some uh, talk about uh, the lack of European vision and strategy despite the efforts that Minister De Croo just mentioned. Why is Europe uh, apparently lacking of a strategic vision of how to address radicalization. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so, uh, my approach a little bit may be different from, from my colleagues, because uh, I think the radicalism is not in, uh, eager uh, with the Islam radicalism. It's much, much wider question, much, much wider. Uh, you, can, you can see everywhere in the world that uh, the world is shifting to the extremism and finally to the radicalism. Uh, you can see the example of the, the last elections in France. You can see the last elections in Greece. Uh, you can uh, state the extremism uh, in uh, countries is a very important question of the my, 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 my minorities, like in China or in Russia. Uh, you can see the violence in Nigeria. You can see the, the different, different problems which is linked to the radicalism. For example, uh, the, uh, the roots of extremism uh, in, uh, in some uh, countries like India. Uh, so I think the origins are much more complicated 
And I, I don't want to, to concentrate to the Islam radicalism because this is existing. But it's not enough to approach uh, from, from this side. Uh, what are, in my mind, the, the, the real uh, reasons? First of all, that uh, was a huge changing in the world. Uh, the, the world was not prepared, really, to the uh, information revolution. And the information revolution opened the, the doors for everybody, for, for every thinking, for every information, and push the, 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 the immigration. Why not? Because you can, you can go abroad and you can, you can try a, a new life. Uh, that's the uh, migration is increasing, the mobility is increasing, and the societies are not really prepared for, for that, that, that uh, situation. And uh, we can state the very big problems of adaptation of uh, migrants and to accepting the otherness in the receiving country. So, uh, that, there is a lack of <coughs> landmark, la landmarks uh, in the societies, a lack of uh, stability in, in the individual life. We don't have a good uh, answer to the new role of the state because everything has changed and was so quick and so, so radical the changing, that's the answers was not prepared. And in, in this field can, can uh, go in, can uh, advance the uh, uh, radicalism. Uh, you can state some indifference of the people uh, to tragedies. Uh, too much are happened. In the, in the world, and everybody can, can follow. And after a certain time, they say, okay, that has happened. But uh, in the next minute, we'll come a, a new uh, uh, tragedy. And if you don't feel that uh, that's, you can be touched also as the, the others, in that case, this is, this is a theater. And uh, uh, that's, 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 for me, it's, it, this is uh, a very, very sad. So that uh, I think uh, we cannot take superficial the problem. This is not a religion problem. It's much, much wider and much uh, profound. Thank you, thank you very much, Prime Minister, for broadening the scope of our discussion. Our last speaker is the former President and then Prime Minister of Albania. President Berish, Albania has been seen always as an example of multicultural and respectful country and society. How is your point of view on radicalization? Radicalization is a very large spectrum and complex phenomenon. But I fully agree with uh, my predecessor that it's, it's increasing more and more. Some of, in one side of the spectrum, there are reactions which are Near North, if you live in a dictatorship without some radicalizations, you doesn't get out of it. You have to decide, you have to stand, you have to fight to reach the freedoms. But this is not the radicalization which has nothing to do with terrorism. The problem is, thank you. The problem is to 
today's radicalization, which I fully agree with uh, the Prime Minister of Hungary, the former Prime Minister, uh, it seems today to be more Islamic but because Islam, uh, Islamic countries are facing enormous problems. But uh, real studies have proved that it doesn't spare religion. It doesn't spare secularists also. And uh, but the moment is the way it is established mostly. It's uh, the root causes are so many. Discrimination, whatever kind it is, exclusions, poverty. But next to them, there are some others. Inner psychological one. As a process is most probably the deepest psychological process. <coughs> I listen very carefully to Mr. Bukro. But I would add some very unfortunate Albanian cases. During the last decades, Albanians fought in Kosovo, fought in Macedonia, fought in Presheva. Never a terrorist act was registered. Never. But what happened in these two, three years? A few hundred Albanians flew to Islamic State. So, there are not three generation immigrants. There are, there are autochthons, hundred and hundred generations in their own country. That is very, of course, I think, I believe, developments are in, in the domain of psychology. And we have to invest. We have to work very carefully. What push these young people? What makes these young is, is much more than brainwashing. That stand and commit horrible atrocities today, some of them in uh, in ISIS area. Probably in overall, it will be very helpful a better religious dialogue. Since 2001, September, the vocabulary the propaganda, the media, went in some aspects far. I'll give one example. I remember after 2001, a young Arab was preparing his thesis in Harvard University. He named his thesis My American Jihad. All in all, he wanted to tell his Arab friends that look how well I performed in the United States and what I'm achieving. The professor refused the thesis. But unfortunately, the thesis was refused also by Larry Sommers, which was then time president of Harvard University. So, now, it's, it's a long debate between the free speech and some, some uh, avoiding some wounded words or some, uh, express, some expressions. 
since since 14 years every many times a day these people listen Islamic terrorism I think this is an encouragement this is a, this is this doesn't work for for its diminution it could make the opposite I don't know when you from early morning up until midnight you, you see they, they listen to media that somehow they consider these people they might consider a blame to their religion in other words has that nothing to do it's not I I I, I Congratulate the, the, the decision of the, 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 the king of Saudi Arabia to call religious people to, to call for tolerance and that support. But most of these people, they have some inner process in their psychology that if you'd like to implement to them, no, you fail. It's an inner process. So probably. It's better to look to some, because it's different for, it's different in Belgium. Belgium is different from France. Uh, 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 so, uh, wherever, wherever, uh, wherever it happened, causes are not the same problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President. We have time to get three questions, please. Introduce yourself and uh, Clarify to whom you are to uh, address the question, please. Mr. Chairman, if, Mr. Chairman, if, although I volunteered here as a, as a translator or interpreter, okay. I do want to intervene. Okay, so please. I can go back down there if you want me to. Sure, down there. absolutely. <laughs> you stay where you are. Oh, you can stay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> absolutely. Felix, Felix, go first. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I enjoyed the discussion very much. And I think I'm a little bit in line of Mr. Berisha. We have to understand it also from the medical side. Based, we have a psychological factor, we have a psychopathological factor, and then we have a psychiatric factor. And all these three factors are going to explode when it's nurtured by ideology of fundamentalism. And then you can with this motivation you can do with the people whatever you like. Two short examples. Example number one has... Uh, and the question, I, please. Yeah, my question is, uh, how can we fight yeah, the media? Because there is a possibility that you can turn down uh, such rates. As an example, uh, Professor Blauer was psychiatrist in uh, Switzerland, in Zurich, and there was uh, such a big peak on uh, suicide. And he told uh, the press, please don't report on the suicides. And immediately the suicides went uh, down to 30%. My question again, which possibility do we have in an enormous integrated and uh, media world? My name is Farid al -Naki. I'm the Libyan ambassador to the EU. Okay. Prime Minister Redelema, thank you so much for, be, for saying what you have said. And thanks to many of you who have opened this Pandora box. I think definitely I share my thoughts because I think now in Libya, we are the victims of the past. The past of the West supporting a dictator and the past of many other things. So I do hope, do you think indeed we, we arm the Arab world as a laboratory? We heard for the last 20, 30 years about all the principles of democracy, of human rights, of all of these big principles, but at the same time, it was hypocrisy and not democracy because it was political, uh, economic interest and you, black, you, you closed your eyes to the dictators who led us to where we are today. Now, with radicalism, for sure, of course, yes, Islamic radicalism, but Western radicalism as well. Do you think how long it's going to take the West? It's not you and us, because all of us are dying together now. We are not alone. Now ISIS is taking everybody to hell. And you only woke up, and the West only woke up 
For four years, we kept asking the EU and the international community what we needed in Libya. We had the terrorists, we had Daesh in the western part. We had our borders open. We had every single country interfering in Libya because sadly, sadly, our bad luck, we had oil. If we didn't have oil, if we were Mali or Somal, nobody would have come to us. And a death here again. When the 23 Coptic and when the Mediterranean turned to be a bloodbath, everybody started to pay attention, but still with a double standard and a hypocrisy. So what we are saying today, enough is enough for humanity. We all are really facing what new world order. 50 years we have the dialogue of civilization, the dialogue of religion, the dialogue between North and South. The men, of course, we as women have been out because you know, we are not part of this global mess, the majority of us. So now I wonder, how long really is Europe, is the West ready to face again, to look in the mirror and say the game is over. We can no longer continue to play the game. It's going on because sadly enough, your children are also being pulled. Your young people are being pulled. So we are all in this global hell, in this global crisis. We need to shift the dialogue. It's not you and us. Prime Minister Dilemma have been pointed the reason, have been point, pointing the solution. But in my opinion, honestly speaking, it will take 20, 30, 40 years down the road if we start with children today, the small brain, the, the elderly people brain is very difficult to be changed for many, many reasons. So I hope that you can uh, you come with our long school. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Last question, please. Women Pratt from Kenya. And I hope you remember that Kenya is in news for bad reasons because of the terrorist attacks. Yeah. You remember about Westgate and recently the Garissa University and actually other atrocities. Even I can even call the, the, the after the post election of 22 or 7 to 8 to be part of this extreme thinking and wanting to move people towards what you believe is good for the people. Now, my question is, Kenya as a, is both Christian and uh, Islamic, and we are talking about better dialogue. I've not seen in the Kenyan situation where the leadership of Christian and leadership of Islam come together to dialogue and then come out with a good uh, solution that can take us forward. You find Christians the other side crying from the other corner, while the Islam the other, the other side uh, saying what they feel from the other side. Then where are we going? If we are brothers and sisters, we didn't choose to be in Kenya. It is our home. So how do we accommodate and appreciate each other with the diversity that we have in that uh, in that region? Secondly, where do we draw the line? between uh, politics and uh, uh, radicalization. Because what I'm seeing, it is that people want to better their life using other people so that they can achieve what it is. Because like uh, with this, uh, the, the terrorism that went in Garissa, where 140 students were killed. And then leaders could come up giving allegations and when they are told to substantiate, they, they disappear. So when we at the, 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 the interest of the public and their life and the, 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 the right to, to live, where, where do we mix? When, when, when will we come to the, to, the, 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 to the line of understanding that we need to live and if you want to achieve whatever, go through the right way? Uh, I do. First of all, I'd like to tell the audience tomorrow we have a session on interreligious dialogue. So we can elaborate that further in that session dealing uh, with that. That's just a point of information. Uh, but I have uh, an intervention on a very serious question, especially to the Prime Minister Dalema. The, the intervention is simply that we must not forget that rage and anger uh, do not uh, require uh, either political radicalization or require uh, religious mobilization. Uh, in uh, What you have is it's like a fuels that are accumulating and then a tiny spark can create a huge explosion. We talked about the cartoons, about the Prophet Muhammad, and so on. Remember, I told my friends in France 
2007, Mr. Sarkozy was uh, Minister of Interior. They burnt all the, the, uh, the suburbs, and there were no cartoons. There was nothing. It was just a traffic ticket or something that happened there. So the accumulation of anger and rage is there. It was the same with uh, American blacks in the 1960s, with Watts and Detroit and Washington and so on. So uh, that is a, is a core problem everywhere. The radicalizers and the politicians simply know how to mobilize that. My question to you, sir, is you said that these mistakes of the West have to be taken into account. For many in my part of the world, these were not mistakes. They were intentional. Absolutely intentional. First of all, from 1992 onwards, the neocons in the United States had been writing about the need after the collapse of the Soviet Union to use American military might not as a last resort, but as a tool of diplomacy. It's been published, and it's well known. I lived in Washington at the time. Secondly, uh, they made plans to attack five countries, of which they attacked only two, Afghanistan and Iraq. Thirdly, there was an outright lie about weapons of mass destruction in order to, to uh, go to Iraq. And otherwise, they would not have had the support of either country to do that. And fourthly, they actually announced it. They created something called the Greater Middle East and the MP Initiative, which included not the Arab countries, not just the geographic Middle East or the Arab countries, but extended to include Pakistan and Afghanistan as well. And they publicly called it creative chaos. That was the word used by the National Security Advisor of the United States. And that the destruction that we have been subjected to in all our parts of the world. Therefore, was it really an unintentional mistake? Or is it time to revise a strategy that simply got our hand? That as long as these problems were contained in the countries themselves, the countries would be weak and troubled among themselves. But now that they have gotten out of hand, then we have to revise it. So uh, that's a, an important question sure. coming from my part of the Sure, world. Prime Minister Masri would answer first to this last question. Uh, well, no, no, you go. Uh, I might say, uh, uh, what worries me about the events in many things are worrying, but uh, the, the concept of the state is collapsing in the region. It is becoming uh, more and more divided and uh, uh, sectarian. Uh, the, the building of a state, we have started some time ago, but it has collapsed now. And uh, this is a very important uh, aspect that nobody, not nobody, very few people are paying attention to, it in, including in our own countries. Uh, this is... Uh, this started with the occupation of Iraq. When, we, when the, the capital of Arabs and Muslims was occupied, the capital of Arabs and Muslims for 500, 600, 700 years was occupied by the Americans, the whole thing uh, collapsed and we felt that the trouble is, is coming and uh, we see what happened after that. So uh, it is very important that uh, we uh, we emphasize the the concept of the building uh, of the state. Secondly, uh, the, you you in the West. Let me say it in a passionate manner. You don't understand. You don't see the humiliation that the Arab citizen is is facing and is, is suffering. Uh, we uh, we uh, the. We were watching on television the Israeli attack on Gaza, no matter what uh, uh, rockets or whatever you call it, has came from the Gazans. But the destruction that the, the air, uh, uh, Israelis caused for Gaza, and we were watching on television, not being able to do anything, not only on the Israeli aggression, but only also on our leaders who were not able to do anything and they were not caring. 
the Israeli actions that has uh, been going on for a long time. Uh, tens of thousands of people are detained already, not of about 11,000 people are detained. So many things are happening, and we look around and we see that we cannot do much, at least our leaders and governments. This is, that has been building in the, in the heart and, and minds of ordinary people that we see the uh, radicalization happening now. So uh, uh, we, we have to do something more than what we are doing. Not only you, but we, <coughs> us, our leaders, our civil society, uh, our politi political parties, uh, it is going in the, in the wrong direction. Uh, even in Jordan, that is, uh, that is still stable, but uh, we are resisting from inter internally and externally these uh, radical forces. And I don't know when, until when we can uh, fight back or, or resist, but uh, something has to be done. And again, last uh, point is that the thing is we are Europe and, and the, the Arab countries are uh, dependent, interdependent. We share the, the Mediterranean. Uh, what happens, you are affected by us and we are affected by you. So uh, the, the, uh, this is my... Uh, Thank you. <coughs> Thank, Thank you very much, Massimo. First of all, let me say something on Libya, because Libya is a country very close to, not only geographically, but very close to Italian people for many reasons. Uh, and uh, we feel responsible also for what's happening in Libya. Libya is a, an example of, uh, in my view, a sad example of the international community's incapability to act on time and uh, I don't think, fortunately, the fundamentalism and uh, Islamic terrorism have no ground in Libyan people because uh, the Libyan Islam is uh, secular and tolerant and uh, but uh, we risk to have a failed state and to have people terrorists coming from abroad with a small <coughs> presence uh, uh, of Libyans but establishing some some uh, presence of ISIS on the shores of the Mediterranean, which is very, very, very dangerous. In my view, the real effort needed today is a deal within different tribes and uh, political sectors, because uh, without some national deal, some unity, in aim in my view, the, the, the goal should be Libya to, for the Libyans. It is up to the Libyans to protect the Libya against the, the, the danger of the, the risk of terrorism. And we must help. I'm very concerned about the idea of military action aim to destroy the uh, ships of uh, illegal uh, of people who, who are illegally trafficking Be because in my opinion without some Libyan partners the idea to strike Libyan port harbor it's very risky, it's very risky, and, uh, but the problem is to make a serious political effort 
in order to achieve an agreement as soon as possible because uh, the current situation is very dangerous for Libyans. But it, uh, in general, another thing, well, I, in my view, uh, <laughs> in my view, the unipolarism of the United States was a big mistake. But fortunately, uh, is a the President of the United States, who openly said that, that it was a mistake. And he tried to open a new season in the relation with the Islamic world, particularly with the speech at Cairo University. The real problem is to be coherent, consistent with uh, the new spirit of the relation of the cooperation between Western world and the uh, Arab world and Islamic world. And uh, in my view, we, we must prove our coherence uh, working together in order to remove, I, I already said my opinions <laughs> on Palestine, etc., remove. The, the roots of anger. That's the problem. And uh, for the United States, it's not easy. And I believe that Europe should do more. Because Europe may and Europe must do more in order to push also the United States on Palestinian issue. This is my opinion. And finally, another point, of course, uh, if, we, if we focus on uh, Islam in Europe, we are preparing a, a big conference in Brussels in June about uh, that issue, Islam in Europe. And, uh, well, I agree, one of the reasons uh, for radicalization is a social exclusion, of course. But uh, in my view, it's not the only one. Uh, we, we have to understand the impact of globalization and, and the feeling of homologation the problem of identity, which is a, a big problem. There is, a, 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 in, a, in a French essay, a very interesting conversation between mother and daughter, Algeria, coming from Algeria. The mother asked the daughter, but why you, you, you had the, the veil? We learned during our national revolution that women may <coughs> go without aid. And the, the daughter answered, I'm studying in their university. I have to study their culture. I have to protect my identity. This problem of identity, of globalization, and how Globalization may respect different identities and not to be perceived as homologation to the Western model. This is a cultural problem, not social exclusion, but in my view, it's very important. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Bicou would uh, add something about that? Would just uh, perhaps shock you a little bit, Mr. Chair. Uh, two things I'm fearing. First of all, the banalization of terrorism. We are killing every year in Europe 25,000 people by traffic accident a year. It is banalized, it is dramatic, and we have great difficulties to move means to try to close this. I'm afraid of the banalization of that phenomenon. Two, uh, I don't know how many campaigns I've done, I think 19 on national field, and 
When we 27 to campaigns, you two, both of us, more, many of us, we are Democrats, try to convince your citizens in Europe to pay more taxes or to receive less pension, and to have a big effort to try to mobilize essential things, which is to ensure our type of civilization. We pay insurance for our cars, for our houses, for our life. We are not ready to pay insurance for all type of civilization. Yeah. That is our job. Yeah. Thanks uh, very much for all the speakers. Let me conclude by uh, mentioning one of the root causes that we have forgotten. In the broader Middle East, in the Gulf, in a country from Yemen to Syria to Iraq, there are today, while we are talking here about radicalization, millions of desperate refugees. This is a catastrophe against humanity. And this is one of the root causes leading very easily desperate people that have nothing to lose to become radicals. What I would have been if I would have been born in a camp of refugees in Syria, the border with Turkey, or in Yemen, these desperate people coming and coming back to Somalia. This is the other, this is the other history to be taken into consideration. This is the delegation of humanity. This is my conclusion. Thank you very much.